And how'd you like what was in the news this week? We have now hit, uh, what is it, that Turkey now is under martial law? Did you hear that? That brings us into interesting times. What's that? Turkey. Turkey. They had that big, somebody went driving through the street down through there and killed something like 80 people in a truck. In France. France, sorry, France. And uh, things just went amuck there. I guess nobody needed a gun to kill anybody now. It's just horrible. You think of all the the uh, families that have lost somebody in just that one incident, not to mention all the others. So it's interesting. So anyway, we got to keep them in our prayers. Does anybody, if, before we get started, anybody have any uh, prayer requests or any blessings or... Something they want to share this morning. It's just the weakest summer, huh? Prison ministry. Very good. You know, I'm my cousin. Uh, is uh, belongs to the prison ministry over in Oregon too. He told me some some stories that they've had there and some real interesting dialogues that have taken place. Yeah, are you a part of that, Bob? How big a group do you usually have when you go in? Correspondence. Oh, wow. Way to go. Wow, fantastic. Well, we'll do that. Yes. Yeah. Oh, that is so neat. That is so neat. doesn't matter. The Word of God is strong no matter how it's done, huh? It's amazing to see how God answers prayers and, and even from our own little corner of the world to that that expands, which is interesting what this whole lesson study is about. Uh, I, find that, I find that fascinating about how God uses people. And what his whole purpose for what he does, you know, as we read through the Old Testament. I don't know if, I don't know if, you've, if you've heard this before, but usually when you think and somebody tells you their idea of what the Old Testament is like, it's, it's a God of wrath and punishment and everything. And then by the time you get to the New Testament, he's a God of love. And uh, I find that those statements just by themselves interesting because it's the same God. He's never changed. And uh, the concept seems is that which seems to change. But anyway, thank you for sharing that. Anybody else? Oh yeah, not to mention out there in the hallway. Oh, oh yeah. No, I, I happen to, I happen to be here, sitting over here talking to somebody. What is it? Uh, uh, Wednesday night, and uh, next thing you know, these kids start piling in. I'm going, wow! I, I, <laughs> I'm going, it's awesome. But uh, somebody's put in a lot of work, and uh, that right there is, yeah, a lot of dedication. I mean, obviously, every little single item up there was placed there. That, that's that's pretty good. Yes. Anybody else? You had your hand up. Oh, your Bible study? Fantastic. Okay, good deal. Personal Bible studies with people. Yeah? Now you just didn't want to mention it seems trivial, right? To <laughs> with other people it's not. <laughs> I think there's a lot of us here that he, there are things you just don't want to mention, but yet God is, God is uh, very good to us, very generous. Uh, we have uh, four out of our five kids here this weekend, three grandkids, 
And so we feel blessed. Yeah, that makes the house sound like, like it's supposed to sound now. It gets a little quiet. I'm sitting there at the house. My wife goes to the hospital and works, and I'm sitting there, and it gets, it gets pretty quiet. Uh, I understand now why my mom keeps saying, hey, when are you going to come visit? <laughs> oh, and by the way, bring all your, all your kids, too. Yeah. Anybody else? All right, well, why don't, we, why don't we bow our heads and begin with prayer. Father in heaven, I, I want to thank you for the opportunity once again to come and worship you. For the people that have come here, uh, we want to take this time and study the Word of God. And we want to see what your plan has been for us. And uh, if we haven't experienced it, that uh, I know that we have, but uh, you want to increase what you have begun in us. And so... I just pray for the power of the Holy Spirit today to come and guide and direct us as we read your word. May your presence be here today and as we get into the church service also. And may all uh, glory be given to you in what is said and done today. All this, in Jesus' name, we thank you. Amen. Well, we are on uh, justice and mercy. You like those words? I, I, I'm curious, you know, I was born and raised in the Seventh-day Adventist church, and uh, I've, I, <clears throat> I have to be really careful uh, about things that I say, because usually when you say something, you're going, this is what it is, this is what it was. and what I've noticed in my own life, that's what it means at that point. God has a, uh, has a way of continuing the definition in my life that expands uh, any word or any action that's that's happened, I, I can look at Scripture, and I can say, "Oh, that's that's really neat." In fact, get this: it was what was it? It was uh, 23 years ago. 23 years ago, I was sitting up there uh, in a Sabbath school lesson, and uh, there was a verse that I had learned all my life, but it didn't really hit me until that day. In fact, we were studying the Book of Job. And it was, and the verse was that was said was Matthew six thirty three, which is, "Seek ye first the kingdom of God and His righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you." For some reason, that which I have read, all you know, and and heard all my life along the way, it became very personal for some reason, and it just hit me. Well, that makes a lot of sense. Seek God first, and he's, He'll add everything to you. And so from that point on, I thought, you know, it's time to just to make a priority to spend time with God on a daily basis. Seek Him first and then see what happens. And at that time, this is my wife here. I don't usually get to have her join me because she's usually working in the hospital or, or at this point she's sleeping because she always works at nights. And so, so she's going she's gonna to hear these things. Anyway, we had five kids at the time, three in diapers and uh, two of the older ones. And, and at that point you go, yeah, I really needed... To spend time with the Lord. <laughs> so what I what I what I like to do because of what I've learned in the past is I now call them observations, my observations, from what I've learned along because I realize that my observation can change according to what God decides to share with me. It expands what I know about Him, and so when we when we're looking at this about justice and mercy, somebody tell me. Somebody give me the definition that you understand to be what mercy is. What is the definition of mercy? What's your understanding of that? Somebody have a good definition of that? It's not a trick question. And, and it's not to say that it's, that it's right or wrong. It's just what do you see as you study the Word of God or even what you've heard? What is mercy? Undeserved justice. That, I like that. Okay, undeserved justice. Anybody else? So you're talking about having you're talking about having mercy and uh, understanding on other people. Right. Very good. Okay, I, I like that one too. Anybody else? A lot of hospitals called mercy hospitals. 
Yeah, Mercy Hospital, that's right, that's right. Helping those in need. That, that's really good. That, that, that all fits in. Anybody else? A definition. Not very good. Not receiving punishment that is due. Undeserved justice. All right? Anybody else? Do, do you like those definitions? Does those sound good? Okay, what about, what about justice? What do you want, what is your, uh, uh, your understanding of justice? What is it, according to Scripture, that you see that you can apply to your own life or that you've seen other people? What is justice? What's that? Getting what you deserve. <laughs> Getting what you deserve. Yeah, that sounds like something I might have said to my children years ago. You're going to get what you deserve. <laughs> <laughs> anybody else that, that's a good one anybody else justice what did you say I'm, I'm looking at you was it you yeah I, I thought you were trying to well if I miss somebody let me know I'm not trying to miss anybody Okay. Okay. All right. A uh, a moral principle. Okay. Good. Moral principle. Something that's right. Justice. Because I would assume that if you're going to base someone or call it justice, there has to be a standard, right? All right. What else? Any other definitions for justice? All right. This is this is what I this is what I want to do. Because I had the same definitions. In fact, I had a, a friend of mine, I don't know if you've seen him on 3ABN or not, John Stanton. He's probably 6'9, big, huge, tall guy. And I remember he was uh, giving a definition of grace and mercy, not justice and mercy, but grace and mercy. And I thought he did a good job, which was grace was you get what you don't deserve, and mercy is you don't get what you do deserve. Grace and mercy. So when we apply this to God, that makes a whole lot of sense. God gives you what you deserve. And, and, and think about this too. Remember when David was asked, who do you want to uh, apply your punishment? you want the people or do you want God? And he says, let God give it to me. Because he knew he was going to be more merciful. I mean, think, I mean, that's, and that's why I look at and all the writings of Paul, in fact, he, grace and mercy be unto you. Well, he knew exactly what we needed. He knew that we needed God in our life to give us what we didn't deserve, but to be able to apply mercy so that somewhere along the line we realize just how incredible God is. So this is what I would like to do. I would like to, I, you know, I can sit and say a lot of things, but I'd rather study the Bible and see exactly what God used to describe what justice is, okay? Because as we go into this and it talks about, you know, we get to Monday's lesson or Sunday's lesson, it says the earmarks of God's people. Well, if it's going to be based upon justice and mercy, I'd like to know what his premise of what his people are to look like, okay? So if you'll, if you'll get your Bible out or if, you, if you're one of those that has it on your phone, I don't know if you guys are that kind of people, but if, if you have your Bible, pull it out. I'd like to go over, over th uh, a few scripture. And so what I want to do is somebody, if somebody can help me out, we go to Isaiah chapter 56. Isaiah chapter 56. Because we're going we're gonna to see what God's definition of justice is. Isaiah 56, verse 1. Who would like to read that? Okay, Bob. Okay, Bob, i got a question for you. What, what, what version are you reading from? The New King James? Yeah, this is interesting because I'm, I'm reading through my King James, right? And because 
I've noticed something. For me, it just for me because the way my brain works, I use the King James for for basically one good reason, is because the old wordage when they don't change it, I notice a bunch of different things because the way that my brain functions. Listen to what this says. Bob had read it, but listen to what this says. In 56 verse 1, Thus saith the Lord, Keep ye judgment and do justice, for my salvation is near to come and my righteousness to be revealed. Now Bob had read where it says, Keep you judgment and do what, Bob? Do righteousness, that right. See now, look at when you look up justice in the Strong's Exhaustive Concordance, the exact same number for justice is the exact same word for righteousness. And it uses the number that I find very interesting. It's 6666. That is the number used for the word justice. But it's used and interchangeable with righteousness. In fact, the majority of the time that you read about justice, the same number, it is mostly used describing righteousness. Yes. It, yeah. <laughs> I'm getting there. I'm getting there. No, he's he's uh, he's jumping ahead. Now I know what Rick, why Rick says those kind of things to me because I jump ahead on him. Poor guy. I get my own. I get it to return back to me. Then I and but this is I like his statement there because really. Okay. Well, when we're talking about uh, justice and righteousness. And we're talking about what is okay. So, what is going to be the definition of righteousness? Who wants to say what that is? What is righteousness? We already got definitions of justice and mercy. So, what are we going to use for the definition of righteousness? Come on, all you guys. You know good and well. You just probably don't want to say it. What is it? it it's right doing. Right. So, when we're talking about justice, the definitions that we were giving, they're right on. But then when he, then he throws a little wrench in the thing and says, well, hold it, that sounds like legalism. So see, we have something we have to deal with. When God is talking about justice and he's talking about righteousness, what is it that he's trying to tell us? Especially when we're talking about the Old Testament. Because the same God who saves us now, the question is, does he save us, the, did, he, did he save them the same way in the Old Testament that he saves now in the New Testament? Or do we have a God that saves us differently? Because if we see God... Did you have your hand up? I am asking a question. I wasn't finished, but go ahead. That's right. And, and I'm in complete agreement. Because, see, if, if God saves us differently now than he did back then, then we got a problem. God isn't the same. So you have to answer that question. So when I hear people talk about the Old Testament, he's a God of, of uh, punishment and a God of wrath. They see, it doesn't make sense to me. Because I have the God that supposedly is of the New Testament, that in which I live in, versus the Old. But I have noticed too many times where the, in the New Testament they keep repeating the Old Testament. So this is why I want to go through these. I want to go, that's just one, that's just one verse, okay? But we're looking at it in reference to the fact that it's identifying justice with righteousness. Here's, and so let's go to the next one. Proverbs 21, verse 3. Anybody have that? Do they want to read it? All right, go ahead. Proverbs 21, 3. Yeah. I was going to say, wow, that is a different version. <laughs> okay, there you go. And we've heard this before. And it says to do justice. Remember, that's the exact same word. I, I've, you can go look at it. In fact, if you have your phone and you have one of those apps, you can go. You can check me out as I'm talking. This word here, justice, is the same word, exact same thing as righteousness. In fact, we found out from the verse previous that Bob read, it literally says, it uses that word righteousness and then reaffirms it later on in that exact same verse 
And it's the exact same word. It's all about righteousness. Yes. Okay, go ahead. Read it from yours. What does it say? Okay, so to do righteousness or to do that which is right. So God is asking us to do something. The, the, the thing is, we have to ask, how does that come about? Because we have this issue of legalism, which is, it's us trying to win something. And in God, yes, go ahead. They're exactly right. What he's saying is you can do... Okay, let me put it this way. And you correct me if, I, if, I mis, if, if I've misunderstood you. Because I've explained this to my kids and other people along the way. It's too easy to take someone who is a Sabbath keeper and because they do not do what's right on the Sabbath, then to make the assumption that will then, you know, forget the Sabbath because of such and such did this. Well, just because someone does something wrong on the Sabbath doesn't make keeping the Sabbath wrong. Right? It's a hard issue. Would we assume it's a hard issue? So I'm going to make the assumption that righteousness and right doing is something that God is going to point to a heart issue. Righteousness. Okay, let's, let's keep going instead of getting, let me getting ahead of myself here. Okay, so Isaiah 58 verse 2. Who has that? Who wants to read that? Isaiah 58, verse 2. Anybody? Okay, go ahead. So, very good, thank you. And I don't know, I, I should have, I should have uh, figured in different versions. I'm, I get so caught up in my own, I'm reading it, I'm writing and stuff down, and I, and I didn't pay attention to all the other versions. My set, mine said this, that's, that's very good. It says, Yet they seek me daily and delight to know my ways as a nation that did righteousness and forsook not the ordinance of their God. They ask of me the ordinance of justice, of righteousness, they, they take delight in approaching to God. So what are they doing there? What is it saying that they're doing there? What are they... What's that? Sure, yeah, right. Sure. Yeah. Well, personally, <clears throat> personally, I don't know. I, I don't know why they have what they do. But my, my, by the way, it's a new international. Version. New international. I'm not, you know, versions are versions to me. I have pretty near every version in my home uh, because I cross reference. Uh, I'm just, I found it interesting that while, if I was reading uh, Bob's version, uh, it then I wouldn't have noticed something when I looked at it. It's just me. And by the way, just so you know, the one that I have is King James. I just don't have the red letter of edition, right. which, which, is, which is that. I just... Yeah. Yeah, you've got to get the... I don't want to get in the version thing. Every, you've got to use the one that... Like for me, it's interesting because I used to be so harsh on King James only type of deal and I and I went back get this I went back to when I was sitting up here and at age 30 I dedicated my heart to the Lord you know what version I was reading the NIV and I'm sitting here going God will use anything he just wants you reading the Word of God 
Okay? So even though, I, even though I'm mentioning King James, don't, don't mistake me for the fact that they're, they're, everything else is a wrong version. I'm just telling you from, my, from my, the way I study and how I look at things, the King James allows me, for me personally, to find things that I wouldn't, that I, that I in my experience, haven't found reading others just because of the way my brain works. So don't, don't, mistake, don't, don't mistake what I'm saying here. All these versions are fine, but I find it interesting because God is going, listen, there are so many other words out there, but I'm trying to show you what my righteousness is. Yeah, oh, go ahead. Before I get further... Yeah. Yeah, right. Yes, right. Yes, yes. So see, the question is then, if, if uh, even at that time it became legalistic in the sense that they just did it out of a form of doing it. Over a period of time, it was something... See, and this is what I'm getting at, right, in our own life, if we're not careful, we begin to keep those, the things that we do in a legalistic form. How do we avoid doing that? We don't want it just to be that, oh, I got to get up and I got to get dressed and come to church. See, that, we have to somehow get to the point where we understand how to avoid it because they, weren't, they were having that issue back then. God was trying to get their attention saying, listen, this points to something. There is something that I've given to you, and I want you to... In fact, when it's talking about... And I was talking to Bob about this earlier. When you're talking about uh, the government of God, God set up a government. When we have children in our home, when we get married, we had to establish a government between the two of us. Two lives coming together. Because by the time we had children, we had to come to a conclusion on how we were going to uh, in, in, uh, have our environment, our government within our own home. Then when you go outside the home, then you have the government within the church, which was established by God. And so you're hoping that all those governments mesh together. And as you know, when it comes time for a committee, not everybody agrees. Okay, so, and all we ever really want to do is we want to, uh, we want to be a witness to the community, a witness to the church. It doesn't matter, a witness somehow that God does something through us. Okay, come to that door every Sabbath. Shaking your hand. That's a witness. A, uh, somebody who's actually enjoying life that's happy to see you there shaking your hand. As much as that seems so simple, it's one of the most important things that we have. No one wants to be known as a sad person. Otherwise, what are we really, you know, showing other people about God? Yeah. Yes. Yes. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Yep. That's right. Yeah. 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 That's right. So when we so he, and he's talking about having that personal relationship. That's where it all is. And so when I'm when we're reading when we're reading about and especially as we're going through the Old Testament, it's trying to understand that the same God that was back then as there is today. And where did they get off track? See, my thing is, and this is why I say observation, is because as I'm studying, I'm trying to observe what's going on there. And if I see somebody having a problem, I mean, I went through I went through a time when it was like, okay, well, we know that there's twelve gates going into the into the holy city, right? And then we're told that you are only going to pass through one of those and that it represents one of the tribes. And so the question that came to my mind is, I wonder what tribe I would be, I would be associated with that would, that would be the door I go through. And the sad part to me was, I, I, ended, up, uh, I ended up being more like Peter. Well, that's frustrating because when I read about Peter's life and everything, it's not wasn't very encouraging to me. You know, I, I find myself wanting to do so much for God, and then I fail in the process. I'm going, oh, man. And then I try to get back up and do it, and I end up 
realizing that it's because I'm depending on self to make other people be able to identify God instead of allowing Him to do it in my own life. Well, that's fine. I can, under, I can, I can accept failure that way as long as it brings me to who Christ is and what I need. So when we're going over this, I'm looking at what righteousness is. We are looking for that which gives us the want and the desire, right? Otherwise, you get in a stuck of formal or, you know, that whitewashed sepulcher. You know, that, that which you look good on the outside, but there's nothing going on on the inside. It's just dead. That's what we're trying to avoid. And so when we're reading about righteousness, and I'm thinking this was all mentioned back there. What were they missing? Let's, let's go to the next scripture. Uh, Ezekiel 45, verse 9. Ezekiel 45, verse 9. Who has that? Hey. Who has that? Ezekiel 45, verse 9. So here what it seems what's going on there is they were exacting things on people. And he says you've got to execute just judgment or justice is what you, you wrote there. Justice and righteousness, right? Is that what it said? Yeah, no, that's fine. Justice and, and righteousness. He says I, I want you to take away all these exactions, but what I want you to do is I want you to execute righteousness. See, now there, there you go again. It's an, there's an act. What is he really asking them to do? If you're going to execute righteousness and justice, what is he really asking you to do? What's that? To be honest. What else? Remember, we're trying to avoid legalism. So with the statement that you're going to make, how do you avoid that? He wanted him to see who God was. And so to do that is to execute righteousness. See, so if righteousness is right doing, we still have an issue though. Only good things come from God. If there is any, anything good in anybody, it comes from God, right? So if you're going to do something and you're going to execute it, is there two avenues to receive it? Is there only one place to get it? Does that make sense? Does that question make sense? Legally, legalism is self-righteousness. So, what you're saying is, correct me if I'm wrong, is, listen, you can continue to look like you're doing the right thing, but that doesn't make it righteous. See, so see, that we run into that same issue, don't we? Just because you're doing something right does not make it righteous. So, no, go, go ahead. <laughs> you're saying life is righteous, but you're really not doing it. Okay, so what we're trying to do is we're trying to figure out how to avoid the conflict, right? So what we're trying to do is figure out how we can rightly use what righteousness is. Let's, let's do this. Let's go to uh, Psalms, Psalms 89.14. I got to move through faster. I'm not going to get through this. That'd be a bum deal to go all the way through and then not to get to the point, wouldn't it? That would be horrible. Okay, Psalms, uh, Psalms 89:14. Who has that? Psalms 89:14. Okay, so justice and judgment, or yours is, what did you say, righteousness and judgment are the habitation of thy throne. Talking about God, right? And it says, mercy and truth shall go before thy face. All right, now, go to Genesis chapter 15. Genesis, no, excuse me, 18. Genesis 18.
Genesis chapter 18. And somebody read verse 19. So now we're going back to the, what God had promised Abraham, right? And it's saying here, he says, And they shall keep the way of the Lord to do justice or righteousness and judgment, that the Lord may bring upon Abraham, and that's what he had spoken of. Go back to chapter 15. And look at verse 6. Who wants to read that one? Genesis chapter 15, verse 6. So here's, it seems like, where the crux of everything is. What Abraham did, he believed, and his faith was counted to him as righteousness. See, that seems to be the crux of everything. To where we're at now, to where they were back then. The problem is, we're in the middle somewhere trying to figure all this out. But a lot of Abraham's life had just begun. It, didn't even ha it, didn't even, it hadn't even ended yet. And it's interesting because I remember when this lady over here talked uh, a few weeks ago about having struggles after baptism and, and, uh, and how to have victory. And this is what's important, is God, God always promises to give you victory in your life. He didn't say that once you were baptized, you were going to be perfect. That was never what it was going to be. Abraham was given what he was given based upon a promise. In fact, well... Let's go to okay. Let's let's go to Judges five eleven. I've got to I've got to get this. I got to wrap this thing up here pretty quick. Judges five eleven. Yes. What? Intimacy. Yes, that's right. Oh my, yeah, I, I think as we look at the story of Abraham especially, it was that personal relationship. I mean, you remember those three that walked up and he invited them to eat? And that was before, that was before Sodom and Gomorrah had been destroyed. And as Ellen White states, she was stating that when those two angels were sent uh, ahead to go do what they were going to do in Sodom and Gomorrah, it was Christ himself who, who talked to Abraham and told him exactly what was going to happen. It's, it's about that personal relationship. He allowed it. He allowed it to happen. He invited him in. I mean, a lot of times, uh, what is it, when you, when you take in strangers, you, you don't know that you may have been uh, entertaining angels. Isn't that what she says? Who... Uh, Judges. Judges 5.11. Who has that? So here he is. Looking at, looking at what the people are doing. As it, it, it's, it's talking about the righteous acts of the Lord. And by the way, it talks about righteous acts. The acts, there are two verses that are used as, as acts of people that are used in the same way the word justice is used. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to move forward. I, it's, as, you look, as you look at the word justice, if you go through the Old Testament, you realize, and I looked at this, there is, you won't find the word justice in the New Testament. 
You don't find it. The word that is expounded upon in the New Testament is righteousness. And why? <laughs> I don't know. I'm just, I'm, I told you I'm observing. I don't know why I'm observing. <laughs> I'm going to, see, see, it's easy for me to make assumption of why because if I, if I put God in a different box. In other words, if God changed after he was resurrected from the dead, went to be with his father, and then he says, listen, go wait for what was promised you. Okay? The 50 days afterwards, the outpouring of the Holy Spirit, Pentecost, the, my assumption quite a while ago was that, that we, we got something different than what they got in the Old Testament. Well, that can't be true. That isn't true. So what happens is, why is it that you eliminate justice in, in, in the New Testament? It may be used in a different form, don't get me wrong, but the word justice doesn't, doesn't exist there. The word righteousness does. You want to know where the words used the most? Is in the book of Romans. It is mentioned nearly 90-some times, the word righteousness, and yet in the book of Romans itself is almost half of it is used. Go to me, I'll show you, Romans chapter 4. If you want, I mean, this, this is an incredible, and so when, when we look at this and use it as a definition of righteousness, you can't separate it from the Old Testament. It's the same thing. Romans, Romans chapter 4. It's all through Romans, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to read Romans chapter 4. We've only got probably 10 minutes, but I wanted to get to this because this really, this really Paul really uh, pushes home exactly what righteousness is. And, of course, it's explained all through the Old Testament. And then, in chapter 4, he keeps referring back to the Old Testament as a way to understand it, confirming the fact that it happened back then like it does now. And this is what it says. Chapter 4, it says, we, What shall we say then that Abraham our father, as pertaining to the flesh, has found? For if Abraham were justified by works, he hath wherefore to glory, but not before God, for what saith the Scriptures? Abraham believed God, and it was counted unto him for righteousness. Now to him that worketh is the reward not reckoned of grace, but of debt. But to him that worketh not, but believeth on him that justifieth the ungodly, his faith is counted for righteousness. He continues to go over this over and over and over, talking about how righteousness in fact, it doesn't just stop at what righteousness does. It tells about how righteousness is given to you, which goes to what you were saying about intimacy, how you receive righteousness, because then it takes away the idea and the form of legalism. See, if we understand how to receive it. Here, what, what would be, if you receive the robe of righteousness, let me ask this, if you receive the robe of righteousness, what does that mean to you? I've heard that all my life. The robe of righteousness. I've heard the story of Abraham. So the question is, what does it really mean to you to have the robe of righteousness? Define in a verb form what righteousness is in your life when you accept it by faith. What is it? What does it look like? Trust in God. Okay, that's one. Bob? Okay, 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 okay. So, see, because I want to put this in a, in a form that is, is a workable, personal deal. Something that becomes the intimate between you and God because I don't want it to just be a word. Righteousness, I've heard all my life. But unless you understand how it's applied, it is only a definition. It has to become personal. So, your, your, your explanation again was of what righteousness is. Okay, okay, so it's, a, it's, it's the character of God manifested in us. What word are you going to use to identify how that is received? We know what it is. That is what it is. That, to me, is the noun. It's not the verb. Okay, faith, yes, you're, yeah. Yeah. It's it's not easy to give a definition, is it?
Okay? Now, if God is going to say, if God is going to say, listen, this person has received my righteousness, how do we identify that? How are we going to know that? Is there an identification in which you can say, yes, that person has received it? Okay, humbly, okay, humbly surrendering. And maybe I'm looking for something that was going to make no sense. I am looking for a definition. The, all the definitions that have been given are correct definitions, but I want to see it in a verb form. Okay, grace by faith. Okay, what's yours? What's that? Love in action. If you have love in action, which you know, which is right, which you know is through the act of God, because anything good is of God, then tell me, how did that happen? What created that love? Serving Christ. Okay? Is there another word for it? Yes. Okay, so if we have one another, love for one another, we know God. Okay, so we know God. I'm, I'm, okay, forgive me, but I'm looking for that one thing that makes it completely intimate. And I don't want to get descriptive, but I'm telling it in a, in a, in a very uh, intimate relationship. When you're talking about being clothed with the righteousness of Christ, when you see a difference in someone's life, there is something that produces that evidence. What is it? The Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit. See, so would it be wrong to say that when you accept the gift of Jesus Christ through the righteousness by faith, you have to be given a gift. Remember, the works of God is that you believe on the one that was sent. And then they said, what is, what is, uh, what is it says, uh, what is the, uh, oh, the kingdom of God. How do you receive the kingdom of God? He said, the kingdom of God does not come by observation. The kingdom of God is in you. When you receive something because of your faith, God gives you something to produce that which you cannot produce yourself, which then takes away legalism. It is impossible to do something legalistically when you receive that which is given to you to produce something. So legalism is not, a, not accepting the gift and producing selfishness, self-righteousness. Does that make sense? So the verb, the verb form to me is receiving the Holy Spirit that produces something that God wants to produce in our life. So when we go to the Old Testament now, it even makes more sense. This God of wrath isn't a God of wrath anymore. When you look at the people that were saved in the Old Testament, they were saved the same way back then. Their lives produced something that was given to them through that very act of faith. So, what's that? Well, they tell me I have till, uh, till 11, but I guess we'll have to, we'll have to end there. Otherwise, we'll get carried away. <laughs> my, point, my point, by the way, my point being is this. When we're looking at mercy and justice, the earmarks of God's people, listen to this one statement. It says this, Even in early Israel, social justice was very much a part of God's law and His idea for His people. Justice is God's original intention for human society a world in which basic needs are met people flourish and and peace reigns do you realize one of the fourth steps in that is called welfare in your life you have a section that's called welfare what happens is with that welfare God gives you something that you don't have and then he says I want to produce it in your life so that you can help people that are that are in that welfare mode he wants you to reproduce it. So when he set up the government in the Old Testament, it was to identify literally how you receive what God wants, wants to give you, which produces something. Anyway, let's bow our heads for prayer. Father in heaven, we are so thankful for the Word of God and what it gives us to identify. Identify your love for us. It doesn't matter if it's the Old or New Testament. And so what we're praying by faith is to receive the rights of Christ on a daily basis. 
that you will produce in us the image of God to restore what you had promised to restore from what had been taken away when Adam and Eve sinned. That is what we want produced in our life. All this we pray in Jesus' name and we thank you. Amen.